Loud voices are more important. Can you hear me? Yes. Loud voices are more important. They tell me that loud voices are more important because the quiet ones are still water that run deep and we don't want to fish in, we don't want to dive in, we don't want to know what they're thinking. Loud voices win election campaigns and poetry slams. Quiet ones write poems in notebooks on folded pages, keep them under the bed until they find someone worthy enough to read it. But it's not about how loud your voice is or how quiet your voice is. The point is you have a voice and you need to use it. So hi, my name is Melissa Raniti Salva. I'm a spoken word poet from Malaysia and my duty is to tell you stories. So, so in Malaysia, I represent a very small Indian community that makes up 7% of the population. And a few years ago, it was decided that as a non-Muslim, I cannot say the word Allah. It is not a word that is in my vocabulary anymore. And I wondered what did that mean for little girls and little boys who sang our state anthem back in Selangor Darul Esan. This poem is for the word I cannot say. Duli yang maha mulia Selamat di atas takta Lanjutkan usia tuanku Rakyat mohon restu Bawa duli tuanku Blank was what they told me to fill in instead of the A word or Tuhan or God or Jesus or Buddha or Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Lakshmi or Saraswati. We'll figure it out eventually. But for now, it's blank. That they told me, the little girl in the navy blue pinafore, to say every time she stood up straight and sang with all her heart, remember when we get to that part, you say blank, which is be silent and then finish the rest. Maybe that's why she never became a poet never became a singer. Instead, she became a poet who still struggled to memorize words that were for her to recite and not realize deeper meanings and understand why she had to spoil the rhythm of the song because they decided what was right from wrong but never told her what to say when someone asked, how come you never say blank? As a sheet of paper, she wrote down her name, age, and classification of which blank she preferred to bow her head to. She was I, and I wondered if blank existed and what blank looked like. Did blank wear long dresses or a suit and tie? Or did blank speak English, Tamil, Chinese, or Malay? Or was blank here to stay during sunny days and stormy weather? I was never sure. If blank could spot me out of the seven billion people or hear my voice against the whines and whimpers of believers asking their wishes to be granted. But is their blank different from my blank or are we all just blank trying to fill in the blank? We keep quiet all that we do not understand, comprehend the fragments of experience through open eye meditation and the sound of silence resonating. Oh. As I put my palms together in front of colorful deities for 10 years, but saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, when I know deep down that the only attention I was vying for was from my father who was upstairs taking a shower, who educated me and explained that Islam is a profound religion whose worshippers need no location of worship to worship, just a direction, and cautioned me never to trample on hungry ghost offerings on sidewalks, taught me that Christmas is more important than Santa Claus, and if you lit candles by the altar, you would be blessed, and that every temple is a GPS, an antenna, to give us better reception to the higher power, which I still refer to as blank. And I believed every threat of, if you cross this line, then prepare to meet your maker. But what will I tell my children if they were made out of love from one man's blank and another woman's blank, not knowing which blank they really belonged to? Because blank is not a word. Blank is not a state of mind. Blank is what we're still waiting to define the divine. But I don't know when and I don't know how. Till then, I am blank. Thank you so much. Um, I, this is my first time in Jaipur, Rajasthan. This is my first time at the Liter uh, Literature Festival. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, 
And I'm going to let you go with this poem, uh, and it's about a boy. I don't do rappers. The last time I did, he was 14 and I was 16, going on 25 to life. Wore faded jeans and an oversized navy blue Lacoste t-shirt and couldn't say hi. Instead, he went, yo, shorty, yeah, yeah, you. You cute, girl, you cute. I blush till the color red pierced through my brown canvas. My cheeks had not known any other word besides baby fat. Fat being the key word, but I didn't move because Nancy Drew always played hard to get, if only for 30 seconds. So when he arrived at my table and waited for me to respond to his sup, I didn't. So he went to a vending machine, bought a can of Coke, placed it in front of me, peeled off the layers of his personality, and said, hi. I'm Arnold. I see you carry a lot of books and all, and I think you're real cute. So, what's your name? For love, my first love, I traded my name for a title. They call me Arnold's girl. And I was the shape of his shadow, the silhouette of his persona that only appeared on small stages under dim spotlights. He told me inspiration came from a joint, so I learned to roll up and we got high on the word. Though he was mostly high and I had all the words, fixed them into his sentences. I gave him rhythm when he had no rhyme, propped him up straight so he could stand for all that he believed in. I didn't give him my heart, no. I gave him my spinal cord, which he shattered on August 30th, 2007, when the motorcycle did a cartwheel three times and landed on his pride and shattered every last cartilage that held together our existence. At the funeral, the pastor called him mischievous. His teacher called him a dropout. His mother called him a baby. His friends called him a musician that never made it. And I, I called him a rapper because no one understood that he was a poet first. And they try to justify, telling me, he ain't no rapper. Haven't you heard of Pac, Dre, Buster, or 50? And I said, now look, I know the gods of the word, like the word of God. He wasn't holy, but they say the good die young, and he's probably hanging out with Jesus right now. So I don't do rappers. That is W-R-A-P-P-E-R-S. I don't do rappers, labels, or titles. Because when a man dies, he leaves nothing but a name. And Arnold left nothing but a broken verse inside me. So I have no rapper. And I have no rapper anymore. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jeet Tile. Um, I'm going to start with a poem I wrote a long, long time ago, but it makes special sense in Mr. Modi's India and Mr. Trump's America, the time of. This is called Rules for Citizens. Number one, let us govern those who undertake the telling of stories. Number two, censorship is good governance. Self-censorship is an attribute of the highest civilization. Number three, if an actor speaks of God, he will be chastised. He will be refused an encore. If he repeats the speech, he will have his license revoked. Number four, let us govern those who undertake praise of the next world, since what they say is neither true nor useful to us. Number five, our best recourse is to be warlike. Number six. We do not deny that storytellers are good at their job and give people what they like to hear. But the better they are, the less we wish our children and men 
to hear them. Number seven, we shall refuse their attempts to be wise. We shall scoff when they repeat their vile allegation, whereof we cannot speak, thereof one must remain silent. We will do away with the dirges of famous men and leave them for women. And not the best among women either. Let us abolish those fearful and terrific names. Kokitos, the river of lamentation. Styx, the river of fear. Ganga, the river of death and life. Lethe, the river of bliss. Tigris, the river of affliction. Number 10. We shall disallow travel and the mingling of songs. This is related. It's dedicated to our great leader. Wapsi. New poem. On television, the new war blares. We sick bitches lick our wounds and try to recuperate. Cow logic, cowed rhetoric, cowardly assassinations replicate the way God dons armor in India in 2017. The earth picks at its scabs, old wounds made fresh, Children crawl backward like crabs to the cradle. No light, no progress, only a cleansing of the unclean as defined by the prime minister's fringe masters. His beard drips grammar this morning, and though his fist pumps properly for the camera, he has lost faith in his tryst. His destiny, his own words make him cringe and grieve for the gone world, the great transformation wrought on the past, the sly erasure of names. Nehru, Gandhi, Ambedkar. History recast for the age of holy terror, the tolerant taught to hate. Why measure time with words when word is met with violence. How tame, how lame this line met with silence. How useless its meter and rhyme. Better far to speak to the birds whose voices grow in panic or pity as man's horizon narrows with his understanding and the sun shrinks to a tight band of porous saffron, loud enough to stun even him, the silent, all-seeing deity. Thank you very much. The 2000s. In the end, it took so little to do us in. The imaginative use of fuel, the fuzzy grammar of this or that group of logicians, gifts of money to the strongest among us. Who could resist those voices raised in unison? The great martyr said, travel broadens nothing except your tan. It was the official position broadcast without commercial interruption every evening at six. The time for lyricism had passed. Also, kissing, sculpture, coco van, the tango, and other items of behavior too commonplace to mention. They had G-D on their side, and we had fear. Same difference you might have said. I kept a wet finger to the wind. Depending on who was winning, I shaved or I didn't. Thank you. 
this is a, a ghazal um, in English. My apologies. A ghazal in English with Malayalam in the title. My double apologies, abject apologies. Uh, risky thing to do up here in North India. Listen, someone saying a prayer in Malayalam. He says there is no word for despair in Malayalam. At daybreak, you sing a Gujarati garba. At night, you open your hair in Malayalam. To understand symmetry, understand Kerala. The longest palindrome is there in Malayalam. When you've been too long in the rooms of English, open your windows to the fresh air of Malayalam. Visitors are welcome to the school of lost tongues. Someone's endowed a high chair in Malayalam. I greet you, my ancestors, O oh scholars and linguists, my father who recites Baudelaire in Malayalam. Jeet, such drama with the scraps that you know. Say a couplet if you dare in Malayalam. And I'm going to end with a poem that I could not have written 10 years ago. You have to pass the the vast age of 50 to be able to write a poem that is titled The Consolations of Aging. And this is the poem. It's a blank page. There are no consolations. Don't grow old. Thank you very much. Oh my God, I'm following Jeet. Honestly, <laughs> who did this lineup? <laughs> Thank you, Tishani. Um, so I'm Janice, Janice Parriott, and I will be, I'll be reading one poem for you. How to write a protest poem. So to write a protest poem, you must live in times like these the season of light, the season of darkness, when the winter of our discontent threatens to linger as long as the one that's coming to Westeros. Thank you. So to write a protest poem, you must, you must expand, not your waistlines or your possessions, but the infernal eye into we. So take note how Sandberg transformed the hungry masses into a collective individual. Remember, he said, I, the people, am the audience that witnesses history. And long, long before a man named Carl spoke about losing our fetters, Shelley Shelley raised the mask of anarchy. Shake to the earth your chains as dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. It's not easy for the few to speak and speak again, to right the wrongs of many. And yes, 
to write a protest poem, you might be moved by spitfire anger and passionate fury. But above all, above all, you must be touched by empathy. When you write a protest poem, you might like to set it to music. You know, the, the, the triumph of brass, the delicacy of string, but sometimes the music of your voice is enough. Also, we all want to be Bob Dylan. And you will echo Aretha, singing, give us our due regard, and Sugar Man, Sugar Man, who's certain that this... Hold on. <laughs> Sugar Man, who's certain that this system's gonna fall soon to an angry young tune. And Gil Scott Heron in his jazz soul tone, who says, the revolution will be live. You know, to write a protest poem, you must be willing maybe not to sell out or maybe to simply acknowledge that everything is not for sale. That price tags, they can be a little noose. So what would you tell a poet who asks, can you sell me some air that slips through your fingers and hits your face and undoes your hair? Can you sell me some sky? Can you sell me a dollar's worth of water from a spring from a pregnant cloud? Can you sell me some land? The deep night of roots, the teeth of dinosaurs, the scattered lime of distant skeletons? Well, yes, say the MNCs and the PLCs and their paid-up LLCs. To write a protest poem, actually, you must end just one thing. Indifference. To hear the poor, rich, gap will widen and widen your eyes and say unfortunate reality. To write a protest poem, let's not give a damn who's eating cow. To write a protest poem, let's leave our students alone. To write a protest poem, you must first repeat the words of Audrey Lord, who said, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because there's no such thing as a single issue life. So cease to split your battles for the Muslim, for the Christian, for the Dalit, for the woman, for the LGBTQ, for the outsider. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle. A cage is a cage from any angle. To write a protest poem, you know, put away your pen and paper and your fancy, super fast computer. Maybe stop looking at the world through a screen, through a window, upon a window, upon a window, upon a window. Leave a mark. Make a gesture. Don't be silent, please. For if this is where we are, in the bedding shops, in the calf, smoking fags out the back, in our office blocks, at our desks. If we're sick of giving more and getting less, then Kate Tempest will remind us that you and me and everyone, we are brand new ancients. Remember, you are mythical. Remember, the protest poem is you. Thank you.
Orphic. As a child, I believed God was in the wind that carried us elsewhere, that departures were returns. I buried the sun in my father's ashtray to see his eyes in Stockholm and Berlin, where the cold is another country, longing another landscape. And the past comes back. Close the door. Solitude will not leave. Close the window. Light will not escape. Close the wooden trunk. Memory will not vanish. Close your eyes. Home will not disappear. Close everything close. All will return, like Mostar in Jerusalem, like the Roman ruins, the Byzantium icons, and the Muslim prayers, the years past. I looked for death in Palermo and found my mother's womb. Looked for life in Thessaloniki and found a song about death. Looked for the image in Venice and found all my ill images. I crossed Trieste with my heart and Naples without my hesitations. Memorized Marseille from Notre Dame de la Garde. Counted all my dreams in Acre. Found my name in the Colosseum. Listened to the lemons fall for hours in Rome. Waited for my lover to tell me the sea can't break. And found the musician born in a small town that reminded me that music always takes us back to the cities we are made from. Good afternoon, Jaipur. How wonderful to be with you. Uh, I've lived an exilic life in four continents due to war. Uh, today I live in New York City, and for those of you who've been to New York City, I live in Jackson Heights, Queens, which is little India. So you are with me every day, India. So it's wonderful to be in the homeland. Um, I'm always reminded um, that poetry takes us closer um, to life. It takes us closer to the heart. And I go back to the, po the Spanish poet Federico Garcia Lorca, who wrote a really important book um, about New York co called Poet in Nueva York, Poet in New York. And I went to Andalusia, which is the south of Spain, which is his homeland, where Christian Muslims and Jews have always lived uh, um, together. Well, if they didn't live together, as many um, uh, uh, have, have, have told me, they created great art together. And Lorca said, lo que más me importa es vivir. And I believe that peace is possible because what matters most is that people want to live. So I'll read your poem from this collection, Poet in Andalusia, called While Waiting for Death. When I die, a map of the world will hang over my bed. The small library in Mijas where I read Lorca for the first time will become a cafe. The olive trees I cannot live without will be in full blossom. I will see death from a distance waiting for me, but I will not move. I will die on a train where the view will be of white trees suspended on gray clouds. I will die in the sky where birds will carry a stream of light on their wings. I will die in a car where the windows will be a quilt of snow. I will die moving. As I wait, my lover will say, you're beautiful. He will mean, I miss the sea. I will say, I don't know the word for life, but no, we must play so that it's not only about death. He will ask, why do we grow stillness? Is it a noise we are close to where the thighs and the stones and the trees and the birds and the echo and the earth and what hides behind them insist on music? A song will sweep by us. I will look at him, he too will be waiting, but I'm not certain for what exactly. Then I will think, solitude knows it's where the empty space is, and death knows it shouldn't count while it waits. This poem is a love poem called In Search of Midnight. Um, I come from Bethlehem. And Bethlehem and Jerusalem has always been sister cities. They're just seven miles apart. 
But today there's a wall that divides us. So if you fall in love, if a Bethlehemite falls in love with a Jerusalemite, they cannot be together because the Bethlehemite does not have permission to go live in Jerusalem and Jerusalem, a Jerusalemite cannot live in Bethlehem because he will then lose his ID. So love is also occupied there in search of midnight. He kissed my lips at midnight. I let him. He took my blouse off, I let him. Took my bra off and touched my breast, I let him. He took my pants off, I let him. Took my underwear off and looked at me standing in this strange, dark, black and white room, I let him. A small light dimmed by the window, I took a glimpse of the city we live in, both do not know. Then he pronounced my name wrong, and I stopped him. <laughs> Asked him if he has ever been exiled or imprisoned, if he has ever mailed letters to a woman he once loved but would never see again, if he thinks we can go back to a lover even if we not love the second time. Asked him if he has ever robbed a small grocery store or stole bread from a peasant, if he has crossed seas, coasts, mountains, and still could not arrive. He answered, I did not pronounce my name correctly in my country, so I was tortured. I did not pronounce my name correctly at the enemy line, so I was exiled. I did not pronounce my name correctly upon arrival, so I was given new papers. You see, a heart in search of midnight is only a heart. Everything else is the same, except what the other is expecting. And I'm gonna end with, um, with a poem um, uh, that inspired by uh, coexisting together. Uh, in a world increasingly turbulent and separatist, I, I do often go to Gandhi's words who said a nation's culture resides in the hearts and the souls of a people. And where there is love, there is life, even. Nothing is even, even this line I'm writing, even this line I'm waiting in, waiting for permission to enter the country, the house, the room, nothing is even. Even now that laws have been drawn and peace is discussed on high tables, and even if all was said to be even, I would not believe, for even I know that nothing is even. Not the trees, the flowers, not the mountains or the shadows. Our nature is not even. So why even try to get even? Instead, let us find an even better place and call it even. Thank you. For those wondering who that was, that was Natalie Andal. Walking around. It happens that I'm tired of being a woman. It happens that I cannot walk past country clubs or consulates without considering the hags skinny as guitar strings. All along the streets, there are forlorn mansions where girls have grown up and vanished. I am vanishing too. I want nothing to do with gates, nor balconies, nor flat screen TVs. It happens that I am tired of my veins and my hips and my navel and my sorrows. It happens that I am tired of being a woman. Just the same. It would be joyous to flash my legs at the drivers playing chess, to lead the old man at house 38 onto the tarred road to lie down under the laburnum dripping gold. I do not want to keep growing in this skin, to swell to the size of a mausoleum. 
I do not want to be matriarch or mother. Understand, I am in love only with these undrunk breasts. And when Monday arrives with the usual battalion of pear-shaped wives who do battle in grocery store aisles, I will be stalking the fields of concrete and ash, the days pushing me from street to street, leading me elsewhere to houses without ceiling fans where daughters disappear and the walls weep. I will weep too for high-heeled beauty queens, for sewing machines and chickens in cages. I will walk with my harness and exiled feet through cravings and renunciations, through heaps of midnight wreckages where magistrates of crows gather to sing the same broken song of unforgiving loss. Um, I'd like to read a couple of poems that I, I don't normally read in public. Um, this one is called Monsoon Poem. Because this is a monsoon poem, Expect to find the words jasmine, palmyra, kurundohe, red, mangoes in reference to trees or breasts, paddy fields, peacocks, kurinji flowers, flutes, lotus buds guarding love's furtive roots. Expect to hear a lot about erotic consummation inferred by laburnum gyrations and bamboo syncopations. Listen to the racket of wide-mouthed frogs and bent-legged prawns going about their business of mating while rain falls and falls on tiled roofs and verandas, courtyards, pagodas. Because such a big part of you seeks to understand this kind of rain, so unlike your cold rain, austere rain, get me the hell out of here rain, rain that can't fathom how to liberate camphor from the vaults of the earth. Let me tell you how little is written of mud, how it sneaks up like a sleek gilled vandal to catch hold of your ankles, or about the restorative properties of mosquito blood dappled and fried against the wires of a bug zapping paddle. So much of monsoon is to do with being overcome, not from longing, as you might think, but from the sky's steady bludgeoning until every leaf on every unremembered tree gleams in the abyss of post-coital bliss. Come, now sip on your masala tea. Put your lips to the sweet, spicy skin of it. There's more to see. Notice the dogs who've been fucking on the beach locked in embrace like an elongated Anubis, the crab scavenging the flesh of a dopey-eyed pony fish, the entire delirious coast with its filter of beach and saturnine clouds arched backwards in disbelief, and the mayflies who swarm in November with all their ephemeral grandeur to die in millions at the behest of light the geckos stationed on living room walls, cramming fistfuls of wings in their maws. Notice how hardly anyone mentions the word death, even though the fridge leaks and the sheets have been damp for weeks. And in this helter-skelter multitude of gray greenness, notice how even the rain begins to feel fatigued the roads and sewers have nowhere to go, and like old-fashioned pursuers, they wander and spill their babbling hearts to electrical poles and creatures with ears. And what happens later, you might ask, after we've moved to a place of shelter, 
when the cracks in the earth have reappeared. We dream of wet, of course, of being submerged in millet stalks of webbed toes and stalled clocks and eels in the mouth of a heron. We forget how unforgivably those old poems led us to believe that men were mountains, that the beautiful could never remain heartbroken, that when the rains arrive, we should be delighted to be taken in drowning, in devotion. This is a new poem, um, not, in, not in my collection, but I, I would like to read it today. It's called End of Year Epiphany at the Holiday Inn. Softly first over egg, burji, and juice, this country is losing her soul because a man in a wheelchair is beaten for not standing to the national anthem because breakfast was once a noble affair, not this litany of selfies. I know, it's ridiculous to think countries have souls, that this one could be feminine. I know I should have faith in happiness and child wonders who will rid plastic from the earth. Oh yes, I know the possibility of a person coming to their knees at an airport crying, who am I, is high, and most people will walk by because time is always calling. We must believe everything will be all right because people are still having babies and taking them to the sea. So what if a man is slaughtered and set alight for love, for a slab of dead cow, for reasons sacred? So what if the waters are rising and those seas will soon be upon us? We must live in the moments we are given. Louder now, in the lobby of the Holiday Inn, this country is losing her soul because politicians declare our daughters safe as long as they're parked at home. And geniuses proclaim the national bird so holy it impregnates with tears. I know I should be kinder on feedback forms. I know you don't really want to tell me how to live unless you're selling me something. No one's really listening unless you're on TV. But there are still people who grow heirloom rice, who long for roses to assault the walls of their homes because they believe in beauty and her graces. And perhaps Part of surviving is to keep your knees soft, to bear grief that the missing will always remain missing. So when the new year arrives with the golden light of a late Sunday morning, whispering how everyone you love will be kept safe, you take those promises deep into the pink of your mouth and you swallow. Um, I'd like to end, it's a kind of continuous theme, I suppose, of loss. This is a poem after my, one of my favorite poets, Elizabeth Bishop, and it's called The Art of Losing. It begins with the death of the childhood pet the dog who refuses to eat for days, the bird or fish found sideways dead. And you think the hole in the universe is so deep it can never fill your grief. But it's only the start of an endless litany of betrayals, the cruelty of school, your first bastard boyfriend, the neighbor's son going slowly mad. You catch hold of losing and suddenly it's everywhere. The beggars in the street, the ravage of a distant war in your sleep. 
And when grandfather hobbles up to the commode to relieve himself like a girl without bothering to shut the door, you begin to realize what it means to exist in a world without people around you grow old and die. And it's explained as a kind of going away to God or rot or to return as an ant, depending on the spiritual way you were raised. And once again, you're expected to be calm about the fact that you'll never see the dead again, never hear them enter a room or leave it, never have them touch the soft parting of your hair. Let it be your parents' advice, it's nothing. Wait till your favorite aunt keels over in a shopping mall or the only boy you loved drives off a cliff to survive but never to walk again. That'll really do you in. Make you want to slit your wrists in a metaphorical way, of course, because you're strong and know that life is about surviving these things. And almost all of it would be bearable if it would just end at this. But one day your parents will sneak into the garden to stand under the stars and fade like the lawn into a mossy kind of gray. And you must let them. You must let them pass into that wilderness and understand that soon you'll be called aside to put away your paper wings, to fall into that same oblivion with nothing, as if it were nothing. Thank you very much. Hi. Rised up this morning, smiled to the rising sun. Three little birds sat by my doorstep. They were singing sweet songs of melodies pure and true. Singing, this is my message to you. Sing with me, come on. They said, don't worry, where y'all at? about a thing because every little thing is going to be all right come on one more time sing it don't worry about a thing because every little thing is going to be all right i've been told i've been told that some birds tweet some quack and some cough the experts say that the winged have various positions of their voice boxes, so only some can sing. But I can't help but wonder about their songs. They say that birds in the forest are the best singers, that the leaves absorb so much sound that their voices have to be more pronounced to communicate. Well, then we are forest birds, y'all. We are vegetation-riddled branch crooners, singing the messages we leave behind. No experts dictate your refrains. This is to the shower singers, the morning traffic serenaders, and the late night lullabyers. This is to the bass in your step, the soundtrack of your trepidation, and the recognition of all the crashing of our music notes, electric sliding with each other into the new day. You see, this, this right here, this is your song. You see, whisper and hum play hide and go seek until they learn how to scream. My grandmother taught me how to whistle. I've never been very good at playing the recorder, but when I get around xylophone, somehow I know how to play. This is your song. From the coughs of a slave ship, a man wrote Amazing Grace. They call a humpback whale singing a vocalization. When black folks and whales harmonize, this is your song. 
Break, beats, bass, boom, black boy bebop. Footsteps, gunshots, pound the ground into a drum. A cacophony of percussion in these streets. This is your song. Hungry stomachs moan like gates on, gro on graveyard shifts. Rustling newspaper, homeless beds in the wind, the blues of the nocturnal. This is your song, your anthem, your banner, your fight, your war cry. This is your song. Playgrounds, busy diners, bumper to bumper traffic, songs. Frying pans, tea kettles, handmade tortillas, songs. Adoration, revulsion, conviction, rejection, songs. Light rail, one mom, six children, song. Teacher, too many students work after hours, song. Rent is due, gas gets blown, not enough hours, songs, and we sing. We still find this music buried inside us, inside of this carousel that just needed to be wound up. And in the days we thought we couldn't make it, most of us did. Us whispers and hums playing hide and go seek until we found our screams. You see this, this right here, this is your song. Uh, let me tell y'all a story real quick. When I was eight years old, all I could recall was all of my energy bouncing. Teachers were appalled before they'd applaud, never knew one day I'd move mountains. And the schools were funnel in, riddle in, and to our skin while other kids were always just clowning. I mean, look at this undertaught astronaut. Thought I was an afterthought, now I'm an aftershock. Picked up this pot and cooked up some food for thought for loose cannons and workshops where the work gets hot. Converting killer stances to kilowatts and watch the clocks like ticking bombs. Because in here, there ain't no second thoughts. Just a train of thought that never stops. It's traveling the speed of knots. I wanted to figure out where pens hid fountains while lead cut heads and words were astounding while some words whisper and some words were shouting. Truth is, I wish these teachers would stop throwing their case out because these kids really needed just break out. I wish these schools would get hit to the break down because these kids really need to just break out. The truth is, the baddest kid in the background is the baddest kid on the playground who needed to break out, needed to break out, needed to break out, needed to break out. I mean, the truth of the matter is all these kids are splattering, not fitting inside of your cage now. I mean, sometimes the tide arises, conspires to compromise all your space now. I mean, sometimes the mind is a steeplechase, time to catch a chase when hoping to stake down. But if the fire mixes with the wind and the sins, who will deny when it turns to a cage now? And the wind's into a fire, the fire's into a chorus, the forest might just fall to the banks now, and the forest becomes uproarious, rising to its glorious. Who deny the skies that it takes down? And if the sky is just as vast as the overcast, running fast, where will you be when the clouds start to bleed out? I mean, sometimes they put us in assembly line so many times, our only choice is to just break out. 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 Look, y'all, um, my name is Jovan. I am super happy to be here. Um, it took a lot for me to get here. I didn't know you needed a visa to get up into India. And I'm here now, rocking my poems with you, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, please give a round of applause for the poets that read before me who absolutely lit this stage up. <laughs> Kill shots, absolutely, great work. Um, I, I, I'm a teacher um, who, who, who likes taking on the bad kids. Oftentimes in America, the bad kids are usually defined as, as, as the black kids or the brown kids, or the yellow kids, or the red kids. Give me those kids, because um, I want those kids. And something um, is a weird force that's working against black kids right now. And um, in my hometown of Aurora, Colorado, we created a program for some students, fourth grade students, who were afraid to go outside because of how often police brutality was in the news in my hometown. And their teacher said, Jovan, we need help to figure out how to get our kids to be kids, to want to go out and have recess and celebrate and all these things. And I said to myself, oh my God, somebody needs to write something about this, needs to say something about this. And so I want to share a poem um, with you that does have a reprise poem with it. Um, but this poem is a dedication to my nephews who, who are so proud of their uncle to be up in India rocking poems with your beautiful selves right now. Um, uh, but this poem can, can be a little hard to chew, so we got some music coming here with it with my fantastic people in the sound booth. They have pressed play, and sound is going to erupt soon here. Yeah. Today, we're going tuxedo shopping for my nephew, Kevin, for homecoming. 
He's 15 years old, and this is his first tame time making a grown man decision. Naturally, he wants the hot pink pants with the hot pink vest and the hot pink tie. I'm optimistic. But he comes out of the dressing room, and my five-month-old nephew stretches his baby arms to the sky and lets out a giggle. And I guess this is just how decisions are made in my household. You see, on these days, we're all black boys. All smiles, all aspirations, bright brown-eyed trying to figure this world out. Learning how to perfect our hair, our jump shots, our end zone dance, our mat game, while your mama makes you put grease on your elbows. We laugh explosive, teeth barely grown in. We ask questions of things we already know. We want to be famous and see the world, you know, like, like kids do. From church skinny ties to flat build hats and matching shoes, from finger waves to gumbies, mini fros to dreadlocks, fresh fitted, the freshest of the fresh, ready to grab her hand during couple skate or bring home a report card. On these days, we're all black boys. All body bags, all filled with holes, all unrecognizable, baptized in sirens and secrets, unaware that others could supersede our skin's darkness. On these days, we're all black boys, our spirits drifting into the night sky. Nephews, cousins, uncles, aunties, black boys. On these days, even grandfathers become boys. They stumble back in the time when this narrative was the exact same, when the entire neighborhood had a funeral in the middle of the street for the kids whose name we all knew. Mother crying in the backdrop and black boys watched other black boys become asphalt on these days. Even sisters become boys, only knowing how to teach them how to find the right partner when they're stolen, y'all. It feels like you're breathing molasses air. Eric garner air. It travels through your body like a horse carriage casket lowered into your chest. Breathing is so heavy on these days, but on these days we're all black boys. But especially the black boys, ignorant and unaware as they should be, emulating their favorite rapper, athlete, or man in their life so full of effort, so willing to try, so unsure of the world's ways, should maybe wanting to be a police officer one day. A doctor, the president, hoping they could steer this thing in the right direction. That he could stitch his best friend back together, but he has no idea that he's going up so fast. He can only see it in the way that they see him. Patrol cars are more hungry. Billy clubs are more curious. Bullets are more inspired, and he knows this. But he doesn't know why thinks he's famous, doesn't feel the crosshair sizing him up, but we all do. Huh. But we all do. But we all do. But we all do. And we still fail to intercept what we saw coming. On these days, we are all black boys, all broken, forever baffled, and right now, all around us, in everyone's streets, still bleeding. Boom. So, so I, I know that every one of the poets tonight spoke a little bit on loss, and that's my, my poem on loss, but you know what, y'all? Like, there's so much bad in this world, but we still got to hold on um, to that thing within us that believes that that one little bit of good has a fighter's chance, right? Um, my grandma um, is like my spirit animal. This poem is a dedication from my grandma. Um, I read this poem on the graduation of all those fourth grade little boys who were struggling to go outside. So it's called what she would have said on this day. So imagine the most cool, dope, black lady coming up to the podium, reincarnated as my beautiful self. And, um, and this is a poem that, that um, is a dedication to her and to my students back in Aurora. One, when the history books are constructed to document your story, 
you mark this day as a victory. When those books open their mouths to tell, the, to tell the story of ourselves, you make sure that you are an author. Let them know that you are not just a boy, that you are also a son, and most of all, a proud dreamer firm in his shoes too. You know, son, when the wind picks up, that's when most of us do our best dancing. That when things get tough, you gotta react. So keep them feet at work, keep that mind at work, keep your heart at work till you find safe place to rest. Three, don't forget where we came from but always know where you're going. That deep inside you, boy, is a mountain, and every day you stand mighty. That deep inside you, boy, is a sunrise, and every day you will defend against the dawn. That deep inside you, boy, is lightning and thunder and all the tools that you will need to unshackle the locks on your wings. Four, like Ali used to say, rumble, young man, rumble to the ground remembers your name. Five, like Jackie Robinson said, life is not a spectator sport, so get in there and play. Six, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Martin Luther King Jr. Seven, somewhere inside of that brain of yours is a dream that's completely worth fighting for. What I need you to do is catch it. Hold it in a place where no one can touch it but you. Breathe it in and hold on to it even when the rains come and they will. So grab a coat and pull up your bootstraps. There is still some sky up there that we have to bring home. Eight, when they mistake you for something that you're not, correct them. Eight repeated. When you mistake yourself for something that you're not, correct yourself. Nine, laugh until your belly hurts. Listen to your parents. Be a boy. Be grass stains. Be way too much for no reason. Be hungry. Be kind. Be your family. Be good to your teachers. Listen for the clues. Put those clues in place. Be yourself and lose yourself. And when you do, you make sure you left a trail of breadcrumbs to lead you back home. And you make sure that those breadcrumbs look a lot like today. Look a lot like victory, like struggle, like triumph, and like bravery. And when you trace your footsteps back, close your eyes. Put that little boy hand against your chest. Take a deep breath in and hear and feel that thing knocking. Ten. Answer it. Thank you very much.